Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome back to Bait Shop Talk Live. We got me, Bubba, and Tim Kidwell here with us. How's everyone doing? How you doing, Bubba? I'm doing all right. What's up, guys? We're back again. We don't have a bait shop, but we're going to talk like we're in one. <laughs> what's up, Tim? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another Bait Shop Talk, guys. All right. Glad to have everyone with us tonight. Uh, so how's the All-Star? I guess we'll kick off with the fishing report. 2018 is not starting off very well for me. A lot of you guys know from the last Bait Shop Talk Live we did last time, but I had a tournament at Lake George. Went down there, was pumped, ready to do some fishing. Uh, put in, it was like 35 degrees in the morning. Headed out, got all the way to the north end of Lake George. I lost half RPMs on my boat, and then it just shut down. And come to find out, I burned up uh, the number five piston, just melted it. When the injectors went out, it was just pouring fuel in there, so it was like a flamethrower and melted it down. Still waiting for that to get repaired uh, $5,500 later. But we're getting there. I got the power head and we got new injectors for it. So we're like this close to having it done and have to start the break in period. So, yet to fish a bass tournament. Looks like uh, my first tournament's not going to be until uh, March when I go down to Lake Okeechobee. Uh, so it kind of sucks that the boat broke the day before the tournament when I was pre fishing. But, you know, I, I turned the trolling motor on and I got to make a couple casts so they towed me back in. So that's why you guys didn't see a video on that even though I guess that would be kind of entertaining, but we'd have to bleep out some words. Uh, saltwater, I actually did put in to go saltwater. I went to Sisters Creek. It was the day before or the day after full moon. I think I've learned when it comes to full moons and tidal fishing, I'm just not going to go. Uh, me, uh, another kayaker named Shane Gardner. Shout out to Shane Gardner. He's a pretty known local kayak fisherman around here. Uh, we... We didn't catch a thing. We fished oyster beds. We fished channels. I had shrimp. I had mud minnows. I trolled. I couldn't get a trout, redfish, flounder, not even a catfish. And uh, everyone else that we ran into, either be it in a boat or on a kayak, they couldn't get anything either. Uh, we were fishing the outgoing tide. It was moving pretty good. It was higher than normal. I thought once the tide came down, they'd get out on the mud and I could get them then. But even, even then, we couldn't get anything. I didn't even see any bait. So that's the reason you guys didn't see that saltwater episode either. We just got completely skunked. Like I said, not even a catfish or no kind of junk fish or nothing. Uh, how about you, Tim? I know you and uh, Tyler went out and went and tried some new ponds. Yeah, so um, for the pond hopping uh, side of the, the spectrum, uh, it's actually been doing pretty good, except today. Today I only caught like two. We were fishing for like six hours. But um, right now, uh, the bass are staying near structure around wood. Um, I guess, and uh, you were totally right in your video, Joe, about uh, about how the wood will absorb the heat, and that's probably where they want to stay. So I caught this one just hanging out by, like, the trees and stuff, and this was my close to being a five-pounder. Um, but uh, so far for 2018, that was actually my biggest fish. It was close to five pounds. Uh, but, yeah, that's... I've been using um, worms. I've been fishing a little bit slow. Uh, I did catch a couple of them on a chatter bait, just trying it out. Um, Florida, it's been pretty cold here lately. Um, but, you know, with it warming up just a little bit, they've actually been starting to bite a little bit more uh, action yeah. producing baits. So that's Thank it. God that's starting to warm up. Everything's starting to move up shallow now. Even the bluegills are starting to come up along the bank. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you, what'd you catch that big one on? Did you catch that on a worm or the chatter bait? So I caught the biggest one on your favorite worm, the U5 speed worm. Can't beat it here in Florida. Yeah. Bubba, did you get a chance to uh, get back in the creeks at all? Yeah, I'm looking right now because uh, Tim was talking about it, everything being cold and warming up. Uh, water temp today in one of the creeks that I go in uh, was right around 70, all the way up around 70 today. Um, you know, and that's going to warm up faster because it's shallow. Um but yeah, all the way up around 70 in there. I went, uh, out of the last three weeks, I went twice in, in some creeks. And one was right, uh, was in full moon. I got out there right at sunrise. I could see bass bus and topwater bait everywhere. And I got on a couple real quick. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, 
top water in February. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. But uh, as yeah. soon as the sun got up, it was bluebird sky. As soon as the sun got up, everything just died off. You know, I caught, I think, one more. It was about uh, three, three and a half uh, up underneath a dock. Uh, they they weren't holding docks. I guess they all ran back out deep whenever the sun came up, or just weren't eating because of full moon. But but yeah, it's been kind of hit and miss. Um, I got out another time in a creek and caught them on uh, caught them on lily pads, uh, sparse lily pads. They were holding tight to those. Um, same thing, not on docks at all, uh, but holding on to vegetation. Caught one on grass. Uh, everything is big and fat though, you know. So it's a matter of I guess finding when they're eating right now because they're not really getting into like a yeah, and not biting all day. It seems like it seems like they'll get a big rush whenever they're feeding, and then it'll just die off completely. Uh, but if we get some prolonged weather like this, where it's it water temps up, it should heat up soon. They oh. were uh, chasing bait fish like crazy whenever you know that full moon day went before it died off, but chasing fish like crazy. Yeah, two things. Uh, you mind sharing the names of some of those creeks you went to, so like some of our local guys can check it out if they want to. Yeah. And, uh, also, like what times? Like you started from what time and what time did you end? Because uh, I'm thinking with this cooler weather in the morning, they're really not going to turn on strong until around 3 on till the sun sets. Yeah, and that's probably true because most of what I've been doing is, uh, is super early morning stuff. Um, lately, I caught, let's see, I caught a big old chunk over Cunningham Creek, which is south of Julian Creek. It's real small. Um, and then Pottsburg Creek I'm in all the time. That's where I saw them chasing bait fish real hard. And uh, Good Goodby's Creek was uh, where I was catching them off of pads at. Uh, Pottsburg and Goodby's, if you go out there, you're likely to, I'm, I'm likely the only other guy you're going to see out there. They're not fish real heavy uh, because they're not super – well, Pottsburg's huge, but everybody thinks it's all salt water. Uh, but it's really brackish. A lot of it's spring-fed, so it'll get a mix where they're holding real tight. Uh, but, yeah, I've been going early morning uh, and knocking off about midday. So, yeah, you're probably right. They're probably waiting until it heats up real good in the afternoon whenever it gets real strong, late afternoon bite. I haven't been out there for any of that other than in ponds. Uh, I've been in ponds for late afternoon bite, and, and ponds have been on fire for me lately. Uh, you know, they were chasing hard. I was catching them like Tim was talking about uh, on a chatterbait, uh, and I was catching them on a swim jig. So they were they were on ponds in the late afternoon have been on fire. So that's probably right. It's probably late afternoon bite here lately. Nice. Tim, what uh, like I know you pond fish. What all ponds do you go to? Like, what's your go-to spot around town? Like the south side. I know you went to the north side your last trip, where you got the big ones, but you didn't get a whole lot of numbers. So, like, what's your go-to so, places uh, around here? So for go-to places, uh, so I live off Hodges. I live on the east side of Jacksonville or south side or whatever you want to call it. So, um, usually Google Maps that is going to be your best friend. So. Uh, I just literally find anything that's close by on Google Maps, and I just go to it. Um, I don't really have a go-to one anymore right now because every time we do go, it's just not the greatest. Uh, so we try to venture out, you know, check out the north side, go to Oak Leaf and all that other stuff. So, um, But my go-to, um, you know, there was one in St. Augustine that we got kicked off of, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Those are usually the best ones, right? Hey, we had uh, I feel like is one of my northern buddies, Vapor Ten and Chad over here it says "cold" in quotation marks. Yeah, cold for us. You know, they they say all the time, uh, like an ideal water temp for bass is like anywhere between is sixty sixty five degrees. Not down here. That's about as cold as it gets. Is like in the the low fifties is as cold as the water gets down here. So ours is is like seventy seventy five is probably ideal for us. But uh, yeah, seventies yeah, is probably where it's at. Yeah, those ponds you get kicked off of are usually the best ones. A lot of my go-to ponds are uh, are just like uh, industrial park retention ponds. They, uh, yeah, they they don't get fished a lot. They keep them stocked full of all kinds of bait fish to keep mosquitoes down, and there's a lot of grass in them too. Yeah, I need to. I'm trying to find a pond because I don't know if you guys know. I mean, I know Tim knows. Realistic Fishing sent me a challenge pack in the mail, and I've been trying to get out and use that. And I want to fish the same way he would he always goes to the parks and fishes from the banks and i want to do the same thing i want to fish from the bank and uh try to complete this challenge pack i haven't even opened it yet i'm not going to open it until i get to where i'm going to fish at and do it on youtube and open it up right there so guys be well, we can that. that we can put you on some ponds <laughs> yeah we can definitely put right. you on some ponds i'll take you to the l pond if you want man 
I've been dying to take you there anyway. Uh, I don't and, know. You think they're you think they're really on at the elf pond right now? You think it's getting warm enough where they should be firing back up? Probably. I mean, today it was actually really warm. Um, uh, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. I don't really know the water temperature of that little pond or where it leaks into, but I mean, we can always give it a shot. I know they're definitely moving up in my pond and they're hunting again. Uh, you can tell from the video they're already getting aggressive and they're hitting top water. They're destroying those frogs. And what you didn't see is the next day I went back with a uh, wacky rig and I guarantee I caught about 12 or 14 of them. And they were the bigger ones. The little, I guess they were a little bit less aggressive or they just weren't warm enough to hit top water. But there is some, they're already probably a pound and three quarters. So by June, they're going to be two pounds and bigger. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the same thing I, I've seen is they, they're moving up. Uh, you know, it's uh, chasing chasing bait fish. You know, the, I guess the, the bigger ones probably still still holding off a little bit. But uh, I caught some good top water here too. And uh, I think since the last time we were on, I did make a saltwater trip. Um, I ran out right around uh, Ready Point, Goat Island. Um, do you guys know where that's at? You guys, local guys, uh, and out by the Dames Point, and caught a few nice little speckled trout but that was it didn't catch any reds no flounder nothing like that but did catch a few nice little speckled trout and one little yellow mouth so you couldn't yellow mouth you couldn't get on the yellow mouth i didn't go to my honey hole uh i was just kind of popping around strolling around throwing covering some ground on some sand flats uh hit a couple of spots with rocks under the dames point and right around the edge of a uh, of goat island there just kind of poking around and and if I, you know, it's, I keep that, that yellow mouth in my, my back pocket. If I'm not getting skunk, I can know where I can go get the skunk off, you know. But uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, I didn't even have any shrimp with me. I had a couple gulp, but no no live shrimp or no dead shrimp, just a couple artificials. Yeah, I had the dead, I had the, uh, dead shrimp out, and I couldn't even get pin fish to bite. That's how bad it was. Uh, I did. Oh, I take that back. I did get a blue crab, though, and he's a pretty big one. If I was looking to uh, make a meal out of him, he would have been all right. I uh, pulled a kingery though, and I punched him in the face. Yeah, <laughs> vapor ass are speckled trout. Good eating. Heck, yes, they are. Uh, yeah, big old nice fillets on them. Real, real good fish. Uh, you know, nice flaky white. Awesome, awesome tasting fish. Right. If you're uh, curious about how to cook them or you're unsure, just go check out my video. Uh, I have a video of how to clean them and the way I like to cook them. I mean, you can always fry them. But if you want to go a little bit tastier, a little bit healthier route, you can uh, cook them in a pan like I do. Yeah, that's how I do it is uh, is pan cook them. And, uh, you know, you can play with, with if you're breading them up or anything like that, too. You can kind of play with what you got on them. I used uh, on those couple ones, I actually used some uh, Parmesan shake and bake, and it was freaking good. <laughs> I didn't shake and bake it. I, I didn't shake and bake them. I pan fried them with shake and bake as breading, but it was uh, it was awesome. Guys, if you're on here, uh, just so you know, there's if you ask a question or leave a comment, there's a slight delay. I think it's about like eight or ten seconds from when this video, when we're talking, to when you actually type something out. So we'll get back to you. If it takes a second, you know, we apologize, but that's what's going on. Uh, as far as tournament news, uh, I missed that tournament there at Aster at Lake George, but I kept my eye on it just to see how good or bad the fishing was. I know it from everybody that was pre-fishing, it was tough. I managed to go to a couple canals and flip, and the only bite I got was from a war mouth on a rattle trap. Only out of 16 boats with, of course, a boater and a non-angler each, only one limit was brought in. And I think nine pounds won that tournament. That shows you how tough it was. Yeah, that's pretty tough there. That's uh, <laughs> nine pounds in tournament. You you said they had a full bag too. They limited out five fish at nine pounds. Yeah, that's that's right. Rough. That's yeah, rough. That, that's like a little one and one and a half. And then uh, just yesterday, you guys know about it in Black of Florida. The Bassmasters had their pro am. I had a friend of mine fishing it. I went down to watch him weigh in. Uh, his name's Michael Cat. Shout out to Michael Cat. And he got third place, won a rod, got some money, and his co-angler uh, won the non-boaters. So congratulations to him, too. And I think he got the biggest fish, too, so he got two checks. Awesome. Right. They but uh, once again, for the St. John's, it didn't really produce that big in numbers, not like you would you would think. Uh, 
first place took it uh, with 12 pounds. That was oh, that's what one that's what won first place. Yeah. So that's... you guys don't think a full moon in Florida affects bass fishing or any fishing for that matter. That that's proof. All these tournaments are not really getting big weight. But on the flip side, there's a tournament uh, further down south in Harris. There's a guy weighed in a 40 pound bag. Yeah, and that's you know that's surprising. Yes, I guess it's you know shows you the difference in in timeline where they're at down south. They're probably about a month ahead of where we are here because you watch a lot of the uh, the tournaments. The the pros have, have run out of Palatka. Uh, you know they'll be catching thirty pound, you know forty pound bags and stuff like that. So that kind of tells you where we're at on the timeline. I guess it's it's real hard to establish a pattern right now. Right, uh, that's usually uh, when they're catching bags like that. It was in March when they're mm-hmm. moving up. And I think they're still, I think they're kind of back and forth. They're really not sure where they want to be at right now, and they're kind of spread out. That's probably what's making it so fickle uh, to catch them. Yeah, that's where well, everything I've found, where I have been out and catching them, uh, you know, St. John's South, where I live here, has is, is been decent fish, but you think you're getting on a pattern. It's like, all right, here we go, and then then that's the only one you catch for like an hour and a half. Right, uh, but you and me, we got to start learning that. Uh, like we said last video, me and Bubba are going. We're going to team up. We're going to be the bait shop boys, and we're going to be fishing the White East Fish Camp Working Man's Tournament, which they have on Thursdays during the summer. I think. Uh, what do you say? You say grand prize is a thousand dollars to the boat or to the team that wins it. That's the minimum. That's a guaranteed grand prize. So I guess if it, uh, you know, more, if, it, if it, yeah, more people that are in it, it goes up. Uh, but yeah, minimum. Is that and then we got a uh, we got one I know is looking a little, little far ahead too. We got one in April that we're going to be doing bassing for babies. That's right, bassing for babies is coming up, and that's also I believe thousand dollars. Guys, that's an open tournament. Anybody can fish it, and it goes to a great cause. All the entry fees. It's uh, forty. No, it's eighty dollars a boat, forty dollars an angler. You know, for your team, right. and all the proceeds go to the March of Dimes Foundation to help all the uh, help the babies out. So it's a really yeah. good, and also there's, you know, even if you don't win, there's going to be drawings, give away uh, lots of prizes, fishing poles and shirts and hats and all kinds of cool stuff, you know, and everybody loves free swag. And that being in April, I expect to see some big bags caught out of that. You know, it's uh that for working man's tournament, sometimes you'll see some big bags, but you only, you got to get on them in a hurry because it's not a long tournament, but that one being all day, I expect in April to see some big old St. John's bags coming out of there. Well, there's definitely a lot of boats already because the way your boat order goes, guys, is uh, is how you buy your tickets. It's kind of like first come, first serve on buying buying your uh, tickets. And me and Bubba, just to give you an idea, are boat number 72. Good Lord. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this is going to be a pretty big tournament. Well, I hope that, that, uh, is- that motor comes back strong. <laughs> so we can hit the gas. Don't be a brand new Opti Max after all the money I just got done spending. Uh, that tournament, if you're curious about it, is April 15th. It's going to be April 15th. So tax day. Black well, Day, get your taxes in and go uh, try to win a little bass money. Yeah, maybe and, you, can, you can win some money to pay your taxes. Dude, I got to win a lot of tournaments so I can pay. They put the money back in my account that I spent on fixing this outboard. <laughs> yep that's uh i guess you're stuck with that one for a while it's a uh, good thing it's gonna be like new yeah it's a good thing you got a kayak too yeah thank god uh, there's no maintenance hardly on that other than just washing it down once in a while and don't go over too many oysters with it you gotta you gotta yeah. feed feed the engine on that one yeah I, i'm the one that's gotta take care of that one pgh All man right. what's up thanks for joining us guys if uh you're you know you're watching this video Go down in the chat. Don't be shy. Give us a shout. You know, we'll give you a shout out here live on the, on the YouTubes. So, plus, we welcome your questions. Anything you're curious that you want to know, please go ahead and ask us. Joe, I got a question for you. Sure, what shoot. Fishing apps. What uh, what do you use? Uh, I don't know. Let me go on the old. I'll tell you what. I'm right probably... here. I probably use them more than uh, both of them. Joe's got the big old nice low rants, well, the the Navionics on it and stuff. But uh, but the mine's just... no, how dare you? Oh, oh my God! I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like saying Ford and Chevy. It is. It is. Yep. He's got a, a nice hummingbird. Uh, which I got, you know, a hummingbird with down imaging, but I don't have maps or anything or GPS on it like that. So I'll use uh, the one that I use on on Android 
is uh, marine waste and it pulls up i mean it does pretty much all the same stuff it's kind of a pain not having it on your electronics because you got to look back between your for your phone and your depth finder but it uh you know it's it's got gps on it. it's got the maps on it um you know it'll it'll tell you the same the same maps tell you what the bottom is tell you if it's mud or you know if you got a wreck or something like that you can plot waypoints tell your heading and speed and stuff like that and then uh, another one i'll use with that uh is just river level because river level pulls uh tides flow water temp off of uh coast guard markers or the little coast guard stations where they have it up so that's whenever you see me over here doing this looking at uh water temp that's where i get all that from is river level i poked around with a few of them on my iphone and there's a few different ones but none of them really put them all together the same like that you have to uh combine like two or three apps to put it the and by the way we're not sponsored by any of these apps that's just uh just to give you guys the info on the kind of stuff we use what uh, uh we we ain't got we ain't got the googan status uh we, do, we don't have apps and games want to sponsor us yet yet I like that word yet. Yeah. Who said yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what do you guys use? You guys use any apps? Uh, I use Scout Look Fishing. It's actually pretty cool because it does a couple of things. Like, once again, like what Bubba said, this we're not sponsored by any of them. But like when you pull it up, the first thing it does is it opens up and it shows you uh, like a Google, like Google Earth image of where you are. And it'll tell you what your current uh, temperature is, where you're at, and also the pressure. It'll show you if the pressure is going up or going down or where it's at. And you can start, click, you know, start fishing trip, and it will track everywhere you go around the lake. And you can, when you catch a fish, you can hit catch. And you can put in all the information, take a picture of it, what you caught it on, things like that. And it will do that for you. And you can select honey holes, like put pins in different areas and put in there what you've caught. So that's a pretty cool little app I like to use. Uh, another one is just... I, I got an iPhone, so Apple users will have this, and Androids might not. Or, you know, it could be both. I got one that just says Tides, and it'll pull up the Tides and show you where you are at in the Tides. You know, be it coming up or going down. Being uh, Living in this part of Florida that we live in, there's a lot of tidal water, so it affects our fishing a lot. And also it'll show you the moon and the percent of rain and how much the tides are coming up above or below, you know, level. Yeah, tides and, near me is is a similar one for Android guys that does the same thing. It'll pull up tides and the moon and all that stuff. Uh, another cool one to have is I think they got this for anywhere. It's just, it's called Fish Rules. You can look up any species of fish. You just put where you live in the United States, and it will give you the updated uh, rules of how many you can keep, how big they got to be, and you can save favorites. That way, you get like a quick reference mark. You can be like, oh crap, I forgot how big sheephead got to be. And you can scroll and be like, oh yeah, okay. And you remember it. That way you don't get in trouble. So yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I have that one too. <laughs> yeah, so if you catch something that you you weren't expecting, I pull that up real quick. Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely a good one to have too. And uh, another yeah, one that I, I got, it really doesn't have so much to do with act, me actual fishing, but I have on there, I have the Bassmaster app, believe it or not. I'm using it more this time of year because I got my uh, fantasy fishing teams on there. <laughs> then I'm trying to win uh, tournaments with my fantasy fishing teams. It's pretty cool. If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, it's like fantasy football for fishing geeks. You can pick Joe Hackney or Kevin Van Dam or whoever you think is going to win out of the list that they give you or who's going to finish the highest. So it's pretty cool. That's what you do whenever you're supposed to be working. Right, right. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, you know, I'm on there like, yes, Greg Hackney called another one. You know, that kind of <laughs> stuff. Tim, what do you use for apps, man? All right, so I have one app that I actually use, and it's Google Maps, man. That is that is my go-to. It's, it's how I basically find all my ponds. But I'm actually on a website, too, and I wish that they actually had an app for this. It's called Tides for Fishing, and uh, it oh, basically so cool. tells you. Is that on Apple? It'll show you the. Come on. You're right. good. If it did it would show you the the high, the lows, the temperature, the depths, um, you know, the swells, the direction that it's going, all this other kind of stuff. It'll show you the UV rays, the temperature, uh, the humidity level, all that kind of stuff. So I usually use that for saltwater fishing. And then, um, I mean, I'm just starting to get into this. But, yeah, Google Maps, man, that's what I normally use now. 
Yeah, I'm really glad to see that you're starting to get into saltwater fishing. That I've kind of now you got that kayak and I've opened up your world and it's like learning a whole new thing again. Yeah, thanks to it you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get ready to spend some money. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Yeah. Fishing, either way, it doesn't matter if it's saltwater or bass fishing or any kind of fishing. It's going to be expensive. And right. That's all it is. Uh, remember, guys. Just I'm going to let you. Do, this is this is the first time I'm telling Tim above it right now. Mark your calendars. Uh, March 24th and 25th. That's going to be our first overnight trip for the uh, Florida Bass Slam. Oh, you want to check see if that works? <laughs> what do you mean? That's what I'm telling you this early. All right, I'll see if I can get <laughs> if I can get that worked in. Sounds what do you good. mean? That's, that's a weekend. It's, it's oh, a, is it? Is that a Saturday yeah. and Sunday? Okay, it's a Saturday and Sunday. I knew better than to schedule it on a weekday for y'all. All right, that should be good then. We can go down Friday night or Friday evening, like whenever you get off of work. We can set up base camp and then fish all day sun, uh, all day Saturday and fish half a day on Sunday. And that trip will be for the Swanee Bass. So that's, so uh, that. yep. If, if you guys miss the last one, that's part of our uh, Chasing the Slam. We're going to be chasing the Florida Slam on bass. And uh, we got to knock off the Swanee Bass. Cause that's, that's, we're going to have to travel for that one. Those aren't around here. Um, and then we're going to have like a whole video series on it, on, on chasing the slam where we're trying to knock off all these, these different types of bass that have different size limits. And then a couple of them are going to be overnight trips like that. So there's going to be uh, no doubt some shenanigans going on there too. Right. Well, I think it's cool about it is it's the kayak camping overnight trip and, uh, just be careful. Don't let Tim come try to cuddle with you in the tent. I, I can, him, I can see him doing that. Well, I, uh, yeah, I'm I'm, for that. If I were to do that, it would just be a slap on the wrist. But, you know, are you allowed to go into a Chuck E. Cheese by yourself? Uh, at least I got beer there. <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm considering running the uh, not even built taking the tent. If the weather looks good, I might take the little mosquito hammock. Uh, we'll, I'll bring a tent with me in case I get tired of it. We'll see how it goes. Uh, if anything, I got a bivy that just like a. Just like a big tarp, you can put over it, put over it for you. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Is bringing a tarp and string up over it if it's rough. But yeah, we'll we'll see if I'm feeling man enough for that. All right, be kind of cool have all three of us in the kayak at the same time. We just got to find us a little campground like right on the water. And I don't know, maybe someone can tell me when spring break is. So if spring breaks March 24th, we will not be staying at Jenny Springs. I can tell oh. you that. Oh no, no. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not dealing with that. With yeah. uh, somewhere out of the way of the tubes and stuff. Be nice scenery, but uh, I don't feel like dealing with that. YouTube. I want to clarify. Joe said all three of us in a kayak. What he meant to say was all three of us in different kayaks. We're all not going to be in the same kayak. Says you. you can get the tandem rig going. You right. me get into a tent. Listen to Joe. By the way, I got a serious question for all of you. Um, have you guys ever heard of these? Reptar. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Bars. They turn your tongue green. So throughout this show, I'm going to eat this and see what happens. Candy bar from like 1999. <laughs> yeah. So if, you were, if you were born after the year 2000, you don't know what this is. Is this a, was that like an original Reptar bar from 1999 or are they still making them? Or is this like one of those MREs from Vietnam videos or? Mm. Oh, gross. Well, it says it was best by 2003, so. Yeah, well, there, there you go. I want to know who hid that jewel away. <laughs> That's, uh, enjoy that. If, if we lose Tim halfway through, we know it's because of food poisoning. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, from what I've been researching, uh, guys, the, the four bat, going back to the slam here and actually getting back to fishing, the four speed, bat, uh, Florida has, I will figure out how to talk in momentarily. Florida has four species of bass. They have the swanee bass, the shoal bass, spotted bass, believe it or not, which I didn't even know until I looked up the slam, and, of course, the largemouth. I've already caught my largemouth. The uh, largemouth either has to be 24 inches or 8 pounds. So Bubba and Tim got to hurry up and get on that wagon. Luckily, there's largemouth everywhere around here. You just got to find one big enough. And then next we're going after swanee bass. And everything that I've researched with them is that they mostly target crawfish. They're almost like the smallmouth of Florida. 
they love to eat crawfish and all these little small streams and rivers that we're going that we're going to be going to the one we're going to be going to in particular is the santa fe river uh anywhere there's limestone rocks and stuff like that, that's where they hang out because they're in there looking for crawfish so crawfish is going to be the number one invitation but you know if we get bored and the bite slow there's plenty of uh, large mouth around in the grass we can have fun with i'm not going to bring any super duty you know flipping sticks because they only get i think the state record is three pounds so mostly it'd be a lot of spinning tackle and like medium to medium heavy uh, bait cast rods. Yeah, I mean that's you know if it's crawfish that does sound you know right up our Florida St. John's alley there with with pitching soft plastics. Uh, you know if we can get around some structure with that because from what I was reading they like to hide behind logs and stuff like that, uh, lay downs and pitch some little soft plastics around there, see what we can get into. But, yeah, nothing nothing crazy on size, or maybe we'll pull out some kind of lunker bass and they're eating on the swanee bass on the large amount. So. I like to catch mine on a, a bait that I actually would build confidence in. You know, like it, it's nothing – there's no greater feeling than catching a fish on something you're not familiar with using, and then it just turns out perfect, you know, in your favor. Like, Joe, what is your uh, confidence built in? We uh, well, my confidence bait right now is that vibe tail worm, but I'm trying to build confidence in is uh, for my video where I got my big, my eight pounder is a, a jig, of course. I really want to build confidence in a jig, and catching an eight pounder really helps to build that confidence. Uh, crankbaits, I don't use crankbaits a whole lot, and I mean, I threw a spinner bait once last year. I want to throw a spinner bait more, but crankbaits definitely. Not just square bills, but I'm talking about deep diving crankbaits. I want to get better at offshore fishing uh, with crankbaits. So if we can find shell bar or something around 9, 10 feet that bass are going to hold on, I'd love to be able to get some on crankbaits. And also, our bishop, thanks for joining us. I know you was going to be here tonight. You never let me down. Thank you so much for joining us here on uh, Bait Shop Talk. And too, while uh, I know Bishop was the one that, that got us all last time, uh, if you're you see if you're subscribed to one of the the three of us go ahead and subscribe to the rest of us because a lot of times we'll go fishing together and stuff and you get to see different fish different angles uh you know us messing around in the background stuff like that that you wouldn't see on on one of the other ones video and we all do a little bit different type of fishing too and a little bit different type of video so go hit all three of your channels while you're at it if you would please oh yeah right. it's kind of like i don't know if you guys have ever seen like the dc shows where it's like you know, Supergirl and Arrow and The Flash, and they're all with each other, and it's all from their point of views. That's how I kind of see it. Oh, okay. I like it. I like it. I, I definitely like our uh, collaboration, Tim. We went out to St. John's. Me and Bubba, I think, have done did like three now. Me, Tim, we when the boat gets fixed, we have got to get you back out. And I would love to do the first annual Mudfish Challenge out oh. here. Man, man, why are you challenging me on this? <laughs> right, because we like other than Bubba, like you and me are like killing mudfish. So I will like if you you need to get Tyler and see if you can guess to rent a boat from the MWR or something, and like me and Bubba versus like you and Tyler out here on the St. Mary's River, like catching mudfish. You know what? I have an idea. What about what if we had a tournament? And it's whoever catches a mudfish, it's a minus a certain amount of points. You mean like a deduction, a deduction from your bass weight? Yes. Okay. I would say you that's, lose. That's pretty up. cool. That's pretty cool rules. I like that. I'm down with that rule. Yeah, Joe's going to lose already. He's already <laughs> yeah. out. Why are you going to do it like that? That's, put that in my head. You know what, though? I only catch mudfish when I'm fishing with you, Joe, because every time it's like, hey, Tim, cast back here. So you know what? You're the culprit, man. I don't have x-ray vision. I can't see what swirled there. I just know something swirled there. <laughs> Getting back to the uh, the baits and uh, confidence, I want to build confidence. And uh, I want to do jigs, too, but not. I want to mostly like pitching jigs and uh, swimming jigs because a lot of the fishing I do would really benefit from being good at a pitching jig because I'm always in like tight spaces with a lot of cover around. Um, I'm not often deep, uh, deep water. So football jig is not going to be great for me, but if I could really dial in like a pitching jig, I think that would help me a lot. Uh, and I want to get better into swim jigs too, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff that does the same that swim jig does. But one that I uh, talking about spinner baits, I did pretty good with a spinner bait last year, Joe. But uh, kind of replacing that a little bit, I want to start throwing a chatter bait a lot more because you can do a lot more with it. 
you know, it's uh, a lot of people will say that they're replaceable in some places. Uh, but you could do a lot more with a chatterbait. Like if you're fishing, like when Joe and I were out there around Palatka, I was throwing a spinnerbait all day. Well, the chatterbait, you can skip that thing under docks and stuff. I was having to, you know, put one rod down, pick up another one. But, you know, chatterbait, you can skip it. And it'll bang off the bottom a little bit better. It's a lot more weedless. So I definitely want to get into that a little bit more, uh, tossing those around. I've been throwing them in ponds uh, lately, and that's that's really an easy way to build confidence in something like that. Uh, you, you know, you know where the pond, if it's got fish in it and where they hang out in that pond, it's a lot less water to cover. So it's a good way to build confidence in something. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I want to do is like pitching jigs and chatter baits. That's what I want to get on this year. Well, as far as like the, uh, swim jigs and chatter baits, like went through it. Yeah. See, Paul knows what's up. Swim jigs. Uh, I caught that four pounder when you and me went out on the swim jig and that was my first time really fishing a swim jig. And we got the other two small ones on there. From what I've learned, uh, the best time to throw a swim jig is like when it's flat calm. Like on days there is no wind because you really don't need all that flash or vibration or anything because everything's just dead still. Big O, man, yeah, you're, you're cool, dude. As long as you show up, I knew you was going to be here. I, I kept faith in you the whole time. But anyway, uh, going back, uh, so swim jigs, flat, calm day, uh, nothing going on, no ripples, everything's quiet. That's when you want to throw a swim jig because you don't want all that extra noise in the water. It's like we were going back. When was the last time uh, you saw a bluegill throwing vibrations in the water? You know, like 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 had and have rattles. I never heard a bluegill underwater. Uh, I think for chatter baits, you want to do something a little bit murkier water. Yeah. Like uh like St. John's obviously that tannic water and uh for tannic water when I say tannic guys I mean it looks like sweet tea. It looks like you know coffee. Or like coffee, gold, gold blades seem to work best. They give off that, the best flash. And then uh, on nice windy days, spinnerbait. When you get that little bit of chop on the water, I think spinnerbait's king on those days like that. Yeah, that's the uh, the difference between the two. I think for me, whenever um, I would pick up a swim jig, is uh, usually the same. It's clearer water and calmer days. Uh, where if it's a little live it's dark even muddy if we get some rain coming through pushing a bunch of mud in that's whenever i like to get that chatter bait out um you know the dip, that's probably the biggest difference between the when i would use a swim jig and chatter bait is water condition on it um you know i like a swim jig i'm uh, throwing one around a decent bit but i yeah that's if it's dark dark water you know talking about that that kind of vibration and rattle sometimes if it's super bad super murky or super dark uh, that that kind of rattle helps them locate it. Uh, you know they work; they definitely work. But yeah, I agree. If it's calm, swim bait, a little more clear water, or swim jig, a little more clear water, swim jig. If it's hard to see, chatter bait. Yeah, big O. Uh, you're talking about the regular, the ones with the bristles for weedless. I know you're new. You got different types. They, a lot of them all have bristles on it. You got football jigs, which the lead of it looks like a football, and then you got flipping jigs, which got like a little bit flatter bottom uh but the hook points diagonal and then a swim jig has more of a streamlined bullet shape uh nose on it but they all have the weed guards on it the reason the swim jig has more like a bullet shape is so when you can throw it in grass and it'll come through there easier and as far as the trailers go uh you don't really have to it, like i said it depends on the jig if you're throwing like a little small presentation like a little finesse jig you don't have to uh put a trailer on there but it helps. I mean, it depends how big of a profile you want to make it. Do you want to make a big profile like a uh, bluegill? If that's what the bass are targeting, like it's summertime and that's what they're going after because they know the bluegills are on the bed. Or you want to kind of slim it down kind of like a crawfish where it's kind of like long. And that's what they're after. So yeah. when I caught that eight pounder, uh, it was winter time, and crawfish get more active when the water cools down. So that's what I was wanting to imitate. So I went with more of a crawfish color and more of a crawfish pattern. During the summertime, uh, about only color you're going to see me throw is green pumpkin as far as the jig goes. I'm going to be trying to imitate more of a bluegill color. And same thing with swim swim jigs. Uh, when it's fall and winter, I'm going to throw in a white swim jig to try to imitate shad. And as summer, spring and summer start showing up, I'm going to be throwing more of a uh, green pumpkin, green Swim jig to imitate a bluegill coming through the water. Location too. Location uh, will kind of tell you too. Where if it's a time of year where I know fish are chasing like brim and stuff like that a lot, um, 
a lot of times, like when I'm fishing in Pottsburg, which is brackish, that whole thing is lined with fiddler crabs all over the place. So a lot of times I'll throw something that imitates like a crawfish because a lot of times they'll be sucking up fiddler crabs even if it is in the uh, you know middle of, uh, of them chasing bait fish, whether it be shad or brim or whatever it is. So so let, let kind of whatever the forage in the area is tell you what it is too, also time of year. Yeah, Paul, uh, I can relate, man. I throw a, a bitters vibe tail worm, which is kind of like a gambler burner worm. And yeah, and like here in Florida, it's money. I actually have one sitting here on the table. <laughs> I think it's kind of funny. But uh, here's, I think it's the same thing. Paul, is this what you're talking about? You got a vibe tail on it. I really don't use a whole lot of gamblers. That's more of yeah. Bubba's area. He, yeah. likes to, he likes to throw pickles. Yep, that's what I call them the pickle because it smells like pickles. Yeah, it looks a lot like the, the gambler with that tail on it. Hey, hey uh, Big L, answer Bubba? your question about the Cinco's and how do you rig and work those? Um, there's a bunch of different ways. You got the wacky rig way. Uh, you can throw it Texas rig, or you can just throw it by itself. It really depends on the area you're in. If you're surrounded by pads, I would recommend maybe a little uh, little bullet weight to go with it, and then uh, you know rugged Texas rig, uh, wacky rig usually around docks, and if it's by itself. Um, usually when it's like a uh, shallow water, that's when I would throw it, um, you know, weedless, but that, that's how I would do it. Uh, the Cinco, the Cinco master, I'm waiting for him to kick in. I'm sure he's chomping at the bit to answer that question. Yeah, that is right up my alley. Um, I've actually got a couple sitting behind me over here and it's kind of, we're, we're getting to a, uh, a little bit of, uh, one of the, the things I was going to talk about too, um, whenever, I was going to unbox my MTB back there, but generally this is how I throw a Senko more often than anything. Just Texas rig straight on there, weedless. Um, skip them all day under docks, fishing structure with them. Uh, they will work pulling them over grass and stuff like that, but I got a little trick for you. If you go on Amazon, you can get, if you can see this, there's a twist lock in the end of there. You can buy a hundred pack of twist locks from China for like $3. So what I'll do with these is your old, you know, standard offset worm hook is I will take a twist lock, put in the end of it, run it over the end of the worm hook and then put it right on the offset like that. And one of the biggest pain in the butts about skipping docks with them. Cause you know, if you're just skipping it, skipping it, skipping it, skipping it, you constantly have to readjust it where it's sitting on the hook one way or the other. That twist lock will save you a lot of pain in the butt about readjusting that thing. And then recently, this month's mystery tackle box I got, um, it had, uh, gosh, what are they called? I forget what they're called. It's like the power spinner or something like that. It's on the other end of it, you get a twist lock with a little, they make these in a willow leaf or a Colorado, um, but it's got a twist lock that goes into the tail end of a Cinco like that. And it makes it swim a little bit better, uh, a little bit more whenever it's swimming. And like I've found whenever it swims, it keeps it more even in a straight line. Even if you got like the hook through like a keel, it keeps it in a straight line like that. And whenever you let it fall with that on there, it falls backwards. So if there's something chasing it, or if you skip a little short, or if you got a real low dock and you skip, it'll, it'll get all the way back up under that dock because it falls backwards like that. Uh, so those are pretty neat, but yeah, that's uh Cinco's, you know, the, the old saying was uh, it's a do nothing bait because it does all the work for you. It's about getting it in the right spot. Generally what I do whenever I'm fishing is I will skip it as far back, you know, to where fish aren't seeing a whole lot of lure presentation. Um, let it fall, let it fall on a slack line. Usually whenever you skip it, pull out another foot of line because if it's falling with tension on the line, it's going to fall towards you. You want it to fall straight down, wobbles on the way down. And then usually what I'll do with that little bit of slack is I'll give it a, a quick couple pops, looks like a dart of a bait fish, and then it wobbles back down. If you didn't get a bit on those two presentations of it, reel it in, throw it again somewhere else. It's uh, it's that easy. There's nothing to it, and it works. Um, if you saw me and Joe fishing Palatka, that uh, the one that I caught that was 4'8", almost 5 pounds, was up under a dock that he had pitched at 10 times. Um and then I came in with the Senko behind him on the back of the boat, and I heard it smack off the back of the wall, that little dock seawall there, and she scooped it up on the way down. Right. It's just sometimes they want that smaller profile. They're just they're not that aggressive, and they just would rather have a potato chip instead of a whole baked potato. Yep. Uh, when, when we fished, I fished a tournament in Lake Lock Lusa, as the 
first tournament that I actually like placed with the club that I'm at now, we fished this one spot that had probably about 30 feet of hydrilla. And we kind of found everybody's, and there's lily pads and Kissimmee grass and everything else around. There must have been 20 boats went through that area I, I easily. 20 boats. Me and my partner rolled up in there, and I was throwing a black Cinco, a blue flake in it, Texas rig with a quarter ounce. And like I said, when it goes down, all it does is this is like a black turd going straight down. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there. And when every time I'd contact that hydrilla with that Cinco, thump. I mean, every time it was like clockwork, and I limited it out. We fished all day, didn't catch anything, and I limited it out within an hour. And we could have stayed there even longer and got them, but we ran out of time. It's always the last hour of the day. It seems like when you actually start to get on some fish and like the light bulb clicks on. But Cinco, sometimes this is the way to go. If they're not wanting that big profile bait, you just go for a Cinco. A lot of times, too, uh, you know, if you guys are tournament fishing, uh, it's a good way to hit your limit and then start working on your call. Uh, you know, because like – Joe was saying it'll, you know, you'll catch big ones on it, but you'll catch small ones on it too. You're going to catch everything on it uh, because it is a smaller profile. It's real subtle. It's not banging around. So if you want to go out and get five real quick, that's often a, a good way to do it. Um, and then it's, if it's like hydrilla like that, uh, or, you know, we're coming up on bed fishing. Like Tim was saying, putting like a bullet weight on the front of it. Whenever we start seeing them on beds, hopping that thing nose down on a bed works really well too. Yep. Um, real quick, uh, for my bait that I'm trying to build confidence in, it, there's three of them. Uh, any type of jig, really. Uh, so I'm in the same boat with these guys. Spoons, I don't really fish deep, or so I've never had to fish a spoon, but I've always wanted to try it. And deep diving crankbaits. So if you guys got any tips, let me know. Uh, not a whole lot on spoons, other than I think you you missed the boat on that one. Spoon fishing's best uh, during the winter time when they're all grouped up deep into little schools. You can just sit on top of them, just vertical jig a spoon, or uh, you can use like a blade bait, which is almost like a spoon. Mm -hmm. uh, deep dive yeah. crank bait that'll come in, that'll kick in uh, summertime when they start moving back out deep to cooler waters. Yeah, we got two shots of deep divers. It's winter and summer whenever they're sitting deep. Um, and like Joe was saying, blade baits, that's uh, anybody who's watching this up north, I'm sure knows about blade baits. So what happens is water tip will get low enough, shad start dying off. They'll do a little flutter and then come back and flutter and come back. Whenever they start dying off of cool water, that's whenever you work at that spoon or blade bait vertically. That's, uh, that's, that's the time for that. Okay. Um, so, Joe, we all know you're uh, familiar with doing it yourself, saltwater rigs. I know firsthand because, you know, you've uh, done it for me a couple of times. But uh, what are some other do-it-yourself saltwater rigs that you guys do? Uh, pretty much like the main ones I use is that four at, on the video I did. Uh, any of you guys watching this right now, leave me down in the comments if you know what I'm talking about. If you want to ever watch that video uh, right here, actually on the table. I got Tim's favorite saltwater rig. <laughs> the old Walmart special pre-rig going to catch sharks off the pier junk that everybody gets hung up on later. But uh, actually, I'm, I'm proud to say I learned all those from my dad. You know, growing up, he was a good mentor when it came to fishing, and he'd show me how simple it was, and I was doing that stuff when I was like eight, nine years old, so that's why it's so easy to teach Tim. <laughs> Here's a good one that... uh that that you see guys spend a lot of money on that you didn't cover in your video i make my own uh popping court rigs um it's a heck of a lot cheaper you can get a uh, you know whatever kind of cork you want to put on it and you can get a roll of leader wire uh for a heck of a lot cheaper you know over the course of it how many popping courts you're going to make out of it slap some beads on either end of it uh twist your leader wire up with some needle nose and and put a swivel on each end of it and you make your own popping court uh it's a, it ends up saving you a ton of money in the end of it. Uh, that Murder Inc. asked uh, what our personal best were for bass. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get mine on video. So Murder Inc., if you go back in my videos, you can see where I caught my biggest bass ever, which was eight pounds and three ounces, and I caught it on a jig. I brought jigs with me that day, and that was the only bait I was going to fish. I was going to be confident with jigs, and that's what I was going to throw. And I got my uh, 8.3 on it. Uh, Tim, he replied down in the comments below. His was 10.2. Tim, if you want to elaborate on like what you caught yours on it. Paul, 13 pounds, 
buddy, you might as well quit fishing because that is absolutely gigantic. <laughs> 13 pounds. Okay, uh, my 10 to it was in the year 2014 in April time frame. Uh, we caught it in Palm Coast. My grandpa and I were fishing off of a dock. I'm actually looking for it now. And he actually caught his PB at the same time. So I caught mine on a popper. Yeah, talk so we can see it. Oh, I'm sorry. So, yeah, I caught mine on a popper. This is it right here. And then my grandpa caught his was just a little bit bigger. He didn't weigh his, but it was a lot bigger than mine. Was so, yeah, right off that dock, and we were just using poppers. Oh, yeah. Nice. Y'all thought, I bet that looked like someone dropped a cinder block in the water when those hit. Hey, oh. uh, Bubba, Bubba says we need to fish Kingsley more often. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. Looking at this, man. I guess so. Uh, my, guess uh, my, my PB is 8.67. Uh, of course, I caught it on a soft plastic toad, but it was actually a Z-Man uh, pop frogs, but I wasn't popping it. I was just swimming it around a bridge piling. Caught it a kayak, uh, swimming around a bridge piling, uh, trying to cover a lot of water with it. It's what I had tied on, and they were hitting stuff moving. And uh, caught it on a, a six-foot rod, real short rod. And, yeah, I'm going to go hit Kingsley, I guess, get this 10 plus. <laughs> right. Uh Paul, just so you know, me and Bubba did go fish Kingsley. It was how when was that, Bubba? Like December, January, something like that. Early yeah, January, January, December. It was like January. around New Year's. And uh we marked we had some giant marks on the fish finder. We used Carolina rigs, football jigs, giant crankbaits, couldn't get anything. And then uh come to find out one of the guys in my bass club was out there zipping around and he only caught two bass and they were in what little bit of grass was left. And they weren't that big. They were those little one pounders. You guys go. We need to go back though, and we need to do it. Yeah. Paul, he caught his three years ago bed fishing with ten pound mono. Wow. Dang. Thirteen pound bass on ten pound mono. Woo! That's well, we're about to we're about to hit bed fishing, and maybe you know we're, we'll be doing it in the St. John. So maybe we can get on some tanks. You know they come out of there. So maybe we can get some on a bed. Maybe uh, not. 10 pound mono, but definitely uh, <laughs> bed fishing. Jeez. So, like, Tim, like, you're, I know you're uh, a field staff for FX rods. Mm -hmm. like, uh, what's your primary, like, rod? Do you get, like to use a lot of mediums? Is like medium heavies? Are those kind of like your versatiles? And uh, also, like, what's your brand of reel, like, your reel of choice? Okay, so uh, I don't have a favorite FX custom rod because technically I'm not supposed to. But as far <laughs> as what I use the most, it is my 7-1 medium heavy fast action rod. It is a multi-purpose rod. It's 7-1. I don't know if I said that. And I let's see, it's going for $129.99 right now on the website. And it's uh, it's it's super freaking nice. Um it's uh it's my go-to for worm fishing and then the reel that i have matched up with that one is my new bass pro shop uh reel i believe it's a six three to one it's a 10 bearing uh reel it, it's super slick super smooth and uh so you get, I, a, uh, you get an the, intermediate six speeds so you're like right there in the middle it's not fast but it's not like for slow cranking either that's pretty yeah that's, yeah and a medium heavy that's about right that's pretty yeah. I usually keep it between 12 or 14 pound test fluorocarbon. Uh, I use P line extra strong. So um, that right there is um, that's my go to setup right there, man. Hey, uh, Big O, you asked like, what's a good starter bass setup? Are you talking about uh, spinning reels or are you talking about casting, like bait casting? You looking for that reply down in the comments? Bubba, what you tell us about the. Uh, hodgepodge collection of stuff you got yeah i got a real mix uh that's for sure um and maybe depending on price range i could probably uh chime in on on starter range if you want something cheap i'm the expert in all the cheap stuff i love all the cheap crap uh my go-to is probably seven foot six medium heavy uh all around use i like a composite rod because it can do a little bit of everything 
you know, do a lot of uh, like kayak fishing where you can't bring a ton of rods. So that kind of gives you the option to do some of the stuff that's got a little more parabolic blend to it, bend to it. Um, you know, so I, I like seven foot six, medium heavy. Uh, you know, also when you're sitting in a kayak, seven foot six lets you get a lot more cast out of it. Uh, but if I'm in the boat, you know, sometimes I'll use seven. So yeah, you bring a ton of rods, you get a little more specific with it. Real, um, man, I think you can get some good stuff for like cast Kings throw as good as about anything that's reasonably priced before you start getting super expensive on it. Um, and then, you know, if, if you're, if you're looking for spinning reels, you can get some, some really good, uh, Japanese ones cheap. They're, they're all, all metal spinning reels, ton of ball bearings work pretty good. Uh, you know, as far as line, um, I go the opposite way of Tim. I, my go-to like all around kind of utility is 20 pound braid with, I'll tie a leader on it. I'll tie either a floor or a mono leader on it. Um, but I usually keep everything spooled up with braid unless it's something that I need bend on a specific rod. My general kind of use is 20 pound braid, tie a leader on, go from there. Right. Right. Uh, for me, like my go-to, like my average rod that I pick up that I put like jerk baits and stuff like on is medium heavy, seven foot. And I use 30 pound braid is usually what I have on it. And it, depending on where i'm fishing like what body of water and how clear it is and i'll do the same i'll put 20 pound cigar fluorocarbon on it but i have specific rods that have only fluorocarbon on it uh for my crankbaits i have a crankbait rod that has a a, like a five to four to one gear ratios for slow crank like really pulling those big heavy crankbaits and has a nice soft tip so when the bass grabs it he can just pull on it and i'm not pulling the hooks out of his mouth that has 15 pound fluoro to get the crankbait down. And also you braid, believe it or not, you can hear it ripping through the water if you have tension on it. And uh, spinning rod, I recently had fluorocarbon on it, but I took that off and put 20 pound braid on that. And I have a, a spinning bait rod, which is a medium action, has a little bit more give. And it also has 15 pound uh, fluorocarbon on it. But while we're talking about rods, Big announcement right here live on Densmore Outdoors. Tim, you're not the only one in the rod game now. Finally. Right. Uh, Densmore Outdoors, Power Present. We got a new sponsor. We got Vexen Fishing Rods. Love them. They're made right here in Florida. Veteran owned. He's a big supporter of veterans. The owner is. I love it. Plus, I just love the way to look at it. I got my uh, first one yesterday. So, not only did I go down and get to see a bass tournament, but I picked up my first vexen rod uh, i'll grab that real quick and show it to you as far as reels go lose big o you're right lose lose are my go-to reels all my i used to use quantum but now i've gone to lose and what i love about lose is they have a, a uh, nice range of price either you can get the basic speed spool for like 60 bucks or if you want to get crazy you can go all the way up to like the tournament series for like 250 depending on how crazy you get some of mine are like I said, it goes back to what that rod is for. I have a, a speed spool heavy duty. I got a speed spool tournament edition, which is an eight to one, which is I use for jigs. I need to take up line real fast. But the majority of what I use is the uh, like the seven to three to one ratios, which is a little bit fast. But you know, I, I know to slow it down. Like if I'm throwing a moving bait, like a spinner bait, then I just slow down my retrieve. But it's great for like throwing jerk baits, worms, anything that you got to get that slack back up once you you know put action into it and thank you big o for the sponsor i want to give a shout out to Bex and fishing uh, you know i really appreciate appreciate them reaching out to me and you know want me and guys i do not promote products i do not believe in i'm not you guys probably didn't know about it but there is there is a company that uh i was sponsored by briefly but i didn't really announce it because i had terrible customer service with them and I, I, I broke it off with them this year. I, I didn't even put them on YouTube or social media because I was so disappointed. When it takes four to five months just to get a, a sun shirt, you know, like a dry fit shirt, that that's ridiculous. So, like I said, I'm not going to say their name. I'm not going to put their, you know, run their name through the mud. But that's the reason I, I just want to show you guys I only promote products that I believe in that, I would buy myself even if I wasn't sponsored by them. And like I said, uh, 
Vexen is made right here in Florida. I'm a hometown boy. I got to support my local businesses. They're up and coming, veteran owned, made right here in the USA. A lot of rods you grab today, they're, you know, you look on it, it says made in China. So, you know, support, let's support ourselves here at home. Uh, Tim, what, what you say you use Bass Pro Shop. You got any other kind of reels you want to talk about? They talk about Abu Garcia. Actually, uh, uh, I use Abu Garcia for my saltwater stuff. So as far as my reels go, I don't have a specific brand that I constantly use, but my number one favorite reel that I have, and it's actually from my spinnerbait rod, and that's my blue pool. I don't know too much about it because I can't it's it's not right in front of me. But uh the Lou's reels are super nice and Tyler's got Scott Martin's uh rod and reel setup and that that Akuma reel is freaking sweet, so um, it's, it's Tyler's got Scott Martin set up. I think he's going to be going down there this year for Thanksgiving dinner as much. He's been hanging out with all of them down there. I've actually, I've got a couple right behind me uh, to answer the, the beginning stuff question. You can go two ways with it. You know, your first year vapor tends over here talking about in the chat and he's actually got a good point. Your first year is going to be making mistakes. You got to learn, uh, you know, what you want first. Uh I would go, you know, the, the best quality you can get for cheap, cheap, more important, because you're going to replace it and you don't really know what you want yet. This right here is one of my kayak rods because I dump them in the water and stuff all the time. Uh, Berkeley Cherry Wood, good old 22 to $27 rod, full graphite. Um, you know, as far as reels, if you want a bait caster real cheap, that's, that's confident to get you into it before you know what you want and spend a lot of money on it. Good old Black Max, uh, you know, Black Max is is hard to beat for the money, um, yeah. you know, or, or Cast Kings. Yeah, uh, if you're curious what he's talking about, Black Max, that's Abu Garcia, Black Max. Yep, and it's like a $35 bait caster that works pretty good. If you're looking like a little bit higher price range, this is a uh, Lou's Speed Stick, but this is the Laser SG-1. Uh, it's like a $50 rod. Uh, it's one of the, the cheaper end of the Lou's ones. And it still works pretty great. That's good for like like beginning bass kind of setups. Uh, you put any of those kind of reels on it that's like mid range, and you're gonna spend that first year kind of figuring out where you're fishing at, what you want. Um, you know the uh, what did he say? Your vapor said uh, what was it? The Shimano Sierra is another good cheap one um, that that you get get decent quality out of for the price range on it. But yeah, I wouldn't say unless you're just rolling in the cash. I wouldn't overspend until you know exactly what you want. Gear ratio on mine, uh, I usually, my go-to is, is 6.3 to 1. That's where I stay at. Unless it's uh, top water, I'll go a little faster, and jigs, I'll go a little faster um, and just kind of slow it down myself. But, yeah, 6.3 to 1 is like my general kind of area. Right, right. Uh, to show you guys, I got that rod now in my hand. When, another thing about uh, Vexen, when you buy a rod, they come with a rod sock on it. So you don't have to go out and buy rod socks. So I think that's really awesome to do that because, you know, you, you spend the money on these rods. You want to protect them. Uh, slowly, I'm going to be replacing all my uh, rods that I use for tournament fishing or I call my bass boat rods with uh, Vexens. And they all come with a nice rod sock on it. I got Fuji guides. This one, like I said, this is my go-to. This is a medium heavy with a nice fast tip on there. So you still got a little bit of sensitivity, as you can see. So when you're throwing uh, like a worm or something like that, you still got a little bit of give on it, but it's got plenty of backbone. Uh, this is why I like to use for like throwing swim baits, like Kitex swim baits, because when he grabs it, he can take that tip in a little bit and you're not pulling it out of his mouth. All my lose, I'll be keeping my lose rods, but they're probably going to be turned into my uh, pond fishing rods and kayak rods, or I'll probably sell some of the nicer ones. And of course, I got it turned the wrong way. So you can see the name. I don't know how good this is going to come up, guys, but there you go. There they are. They got a snake on there. Of course, they got all what size line and what size weight you can put on there. And I love how these handles are. I like to uh, palm my reels, and it just fits really nice in there. And Vexen got smart. I don't know what the crap Luz is thinking about putting wind grip, like white and bright orange and neon wind grips on the rods because your hands get dirty you're out there fishing and now your rods look like crap so they actually use black and they mix the wind grips into the foam 
So you even got a better, and I like a split grip on all my bait cast rods. I don't know what it is. Some people, you know, to each their own, they offer one that's not a split grip, but I love a split grip on mine. And I cannot wait to take one of my lures off and put it on here. And matter of fact, tomorrow, that's probably what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw a toad for you, Bubba. I'm going to throw all a right. toad. On, put my spinner reel and throw a toad out there in the pond, see if I can't get any top where it blow ups. But uh, I am looking real excited. Uh, my next Vexen I'm probably going to get is going to be a extra heavy. I'm talking a straight broomstick because I'll be going down to uh, Okeechobee and another confidence thing. I want to learn how to punch. I want to be able to throw punch rigs. And when you're flipping them hyphen mats or the, the penny wart and stuff like that, you need an extra heavy because you want that bass to get out. You don't want to spend time with him fighting and pulling back down. You want to get him the heck out of there. Yeah, big O. Go check him out. Uh, I'm going to start leaving links down in the description below of all my videos for uh, for Vexen Rods. Uh, I can't wait to work with this company. I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. Well, uh, I guess as, as we're getting uh, – we, we killed an hour uh, as we're getting to the end here. If, if you guys got any questions in the chat, anything, uh, questions, comments, any stuff like that, go ahead and fire those off now. Uh, what do we? What, what do you guys got planned coming ahead while we're waiting to see if they got any questions or anything? Well, um, so just to start off, I have a 250 subscriber giveaway happening. I actually have everything I'm going to be giving away in this box. I can go through this. The only two things that I'm missing is a crankbait and a whopper plopper. But as soon as I hit that 250, believe me, it's going to get sent out. I've got frogs. I've got a crap ton of plastics like it's insane i've got kbd strike king plastics i've got doomsday tackle i've got havoc um a bunch of field and stream stuff uh, i got a buzz bait spinner bait more frogs this right here this this stuff's awesome it's the sunset it's uh, sunscreen plus insect repellent. So living here in Florida, you got the mosquitoes. They just drive you insane. This stuff right here will definitely help prevent that. Um, I got some FX Custom Rod stickers. These are pretty sweet. And then I'm also signed with fins. So I'm going to throw in a, um, a fin sticker, uh, spinner baits, and yeah. And then again, like I said, I'm missing a crankbait and a whopper plopper. But by the time I hit 250, they'll be in the box. So definitely subscribe. There's my plug. Right. Guys, like, uh, don't be shy. You know, leave it. Well, ask us some questions. We love answering questions. I love it. And also, if you haven't yet, go ahead and leave the video a thumbs up so it helps us out. And Tim has his 250 subscriber giveaway. I don't know. Tim, you should have way more subscribers than you do. Your editing skills are freaking crazy good. I, I'm jealous of your editing skills. But I have my thousand subscriber giveaway, and I haven't showed any of you guys of what I'm give, actually giving away. So those of you guys that are joining us right now and watching this video, you get a sneak peek. So I'm fixing to release the giveaway video. But here we got uh, – mine are mostly tools. Last time I did fish and tackle. Not everybody bass fishes on my channel. Some people like saltwater. Some people like freshwater. But this is for uh, anybody. It doesn't matter if you're freshwater or saltwater fish. These are all tools that everybody uses fishing. Got us a fillet knife. Got us a six inch fillet knife so you can clean your catch. Big O, if you win this, you can use it on those nice redfish you're catching down there. And then next, then glow in the dark fish grips like I have in my kayak. We're either catching either mudfish, pickerel, or sea trout, or flounder. Like I said, no matter what body of water you're in, everybody needs fish grips. Uh, we also got a nice pair of pliers with a pouch. Then you use pliers to get your hooks out. You got a knife, everything else. that would be awesome to keep in your kayak or in your boat. And we got at least some kind of tools in there, you know, better than nothing. And a scale. I believe this one goes up to 50 pounds. It's a 50 pound scale that comes with a tape measure. You can see it in the little picture right there. I didn't take anything out of the box. That way, you know, when you guys win it, you can take it with you. And, you know, I didn't mess with it. That way, you know, it'd be like a little mini Christmas. You open up all your presents. So I got a uh, question from Vapor here. He uh, 
He asks, you guys ever pour your own plastics and make your own scent? Well, I make my own scent all day, every day. But do I pour my own plastics? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I save all my, my busted Senkos and toads and stuff like that. Where I fish, I get a lot of gar bites, uh, and they will just rip something in half. So then I'm stuck with two casts with a piece of plastic that, you know, I can't do anything with. So I throw it in the bottom of the boat or bottom of Joe's boat and – you know, I'll use that later to melt down and re-pour it. Uh, I'm going to do a DIY video on how I do this one day. This is just plaster of Paris. Uh, and this one, you can see that I was putting some color in it. But that is a toad mold for plaster of Paris. Uh, you got to make them in, you know, halves and then go in and cut your little hole. I don't even inject. Uh, I just pour it straight out of a mixing cup and bevel out the edges of it. But, yeah, absolutely. I make my own, my pour my own plastics all the time. Uh you know, I will throw some scent in there with it. Uh, what about you guys? You guys ever do any of that? Yeah, I, I don't. I'm I'm looking into uh, doing injection molding baits. First, uh, rocking the 904 Ocean Way North Side. I thanks for joining us. You're a little late to the show, but thanks for joining us, Paul. I've been meaning to get to your question. I did ignore you. I'm sorry about that. It's just that I've been uh, on my military weekend. I haven't been able to reply to any comments. So, but he was wanting to know how uh, the PVC tubes on my fluid bed for when I color my weights. He's wanting to know how long that I make them. Uh, I, originally, the instructions I saw said four inches, but man, that was like way too high by the time you got done with everything. So I cut them down to uh, two and a half, uh, two and a half inches. When that time you fit them with that union, it seems to work out perfect. It's not too high. You're like up here trying to dip everything. It's like nice and level when you set it on the table. So, Paul, two and a half inches on those uh, PVC pipes is what I use for that fluid bed. And for the guys that don't know what I'm talking about, I have a video where um, you can buy powder paint. And you make a fluid bed with some PVC pieces and a fish aerator, and it floats that powder paint up. So you can just heat up your worm weight, dunk into that powder paint, and it cooks it right on there. I need to get back on that. Actually, I need to make some uh, green pumpkin powder paint or painted worm weights. And if I get those uh, tungsten, I need to get some ounce and a half tungsten. No, Tim, I'm not getting yours. I'm not getting woos. I'm going to be going with flat out tungsten. And uh, I'm probably powder paint a couple of those. Like green pumpkin, like green pumpkin and uh, black and blue. Those like my two go to colors here in Florida, like either natural or black and blue. But I answer that. Yeah, military weekend. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm in the Navy. So. I go to NAS Jacks. We got a rock of the 904. It's like he's with the Air National Guard. Thank you for your service, man. Appreciate it. Um, I know it's also, if you guys don't know, Tim is also in the service. I'm a, I'm part-time. I did uh, six years active duty. I couldn't get any short duty orders here at home, so I told him, heck with it, I'm getting out. I went reserve, and then uh, Tim... He's still active. He got lucky enough to get stationed here. So, you know, Tim's in there too. Yep. Um, I've actually been here in Jacksonville since May of 2013, and I'm looking to be here until March of 2020. So there's going to be a lot more fishing with these two guys coming up here in the near future. Right. Paul, uh, I'm a SW2. So thank you for your service, Paul. He's, you've already reached that goal I'm trying to get retirement i got uh four more years but i'm getting there bubba he may look like a you know battle hardened marine <laughs> but he's just a big supporter and we we're very thankful that we have bubba yeah hey, yeah no not a yeah. service guy but thank you guys for your service i spent uh my early 20s college and fighting so <laughs> yeah that's the one thing if you guys uh, bubba guys go check out bubba outdoors videos um it's nothing fancy but he has some really cool stories, and he has some good stuff. And I mean, he's the only guy I know that almost got knocked over by a manatee in a kayak. He's on, I think that's on every one of your openings. And every time I fish with Bubba, I get a new story. It's kind of cool. Like Every time I go, it's like little pieces of the puzzle of Bubba that I get to find out. Like uh, Just to give you guys a little cliffhanger that I found out, Bubba was an MMA fighter. He was a cage fighter. That's no lie. He showed me the videos. He's, he wasn't pulling my leg. It wasn't like in somebody's backyard. He was like, no lie, a cage fighter. And also the other story was the midget on the moped. 
So every time <laughs> that I go out, I hear an interesting story from Bubba. Yeah, there's some uh, there, there's some some colorful history that that create a character like this, I guess. Uh, that uh, the guy on the moped was on Judge Judy too, so you can you can find that clip somewhere. But yeah, yeah, it's uh, but yeah, no, never in service. Thank you guys for your service, though. Even the guys watching. Bob, a uh, quick question, like getting back to fishing. Have you ever used, or anyone else, anybody else in uh, watching this, has anybody ever used? It's going to show up backwards, but it's saying Cast King. Have you used Cast King yes. braids before? Yes, yes, I have. What's your thoughts? Uh, my my. All right, so my thoughts on line in general. There's a lot of difference in brands between mono and fluoro. Braid, I've found a lot of times is braid. Um, I wouldn't buy the cheapest possible braid you could find, but it would be casking. <laughs> no, which would be so gay a lang or whatever kind of Asian stuff that comes with not English writing on it. Uh, but as far as like from casking and up, I, I it works. It's braid. Never had so, an issue with it. No, I use both, but I use casking for saltwater. What I've noticed between casking and uh, Power Pro, Power Pro is my go to braid. With Cast King, it fades out crazy quick. Like uh, green's like my go-to color, but uh, I recently found out Power Pro makes it brown. So I'm gonna be going to that uh, here shortly, uh, since it fits in perfect with our tannic water we got here in Florida. But this Cast King, it fades out super quick. So if you get the green line, it almost turns white within like maybe about two or three trips. And also, it like with Power Pro, the individual strands that they put in it are more tightly together in power pro than this. This I can feel like as you run your nails across it, which would be the same as the eyes in your rod, you can feel each strand. It's a little bit more rough. It's not quite as smooth, but you know, like in a pinch, it'll work. Uh, this, this, uh, power pro or sorry, casting that I have here. This is a 120 pound test, 120 pound test, uh, braid. And this is what I got on my big shark setup. My, uh, thin, not all, with a big uh, roller guided rod. Can't wait for summertime. Do, we're going to have some shark fishing videos. I hope you guys are looking forward to that. We're going to be doing shark fishing uh, in some small creeks, shark fishing off the beach. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to get the big boat out or not, which y'all haven't even seen that. But there's going to be, I'm going to try to do a whole bunch of shark fishing videos and play them all during Shark Week. That, I think that'd be awesome. Well, let me know you want to do that, Joe. I'm dying to get out there and catch a shark. Right. It's a matter of catching the big sharks. There's 20 million of those little four-foot Atlantic shark, uh, sharp nose. I want to see Bubba hooked up on my big pin with like a 10-foot hammerhead. I can't wait to see that. Um, I'll wrestle that joker in there. I'll winch him in there. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he'll go in after him. I'll get him. Man yep. fears nothing. <laughs> I'll jump in there after him. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I don't know. You guys got anything else? We wrap them up. Yeah, I think uh, we'll we'll wrap it up for the night. We definitely thank all you guys that made it. Sorry for the folks that got in here at the last minute. You know, I understand everybody's got things to do. Dinner time, you know, church things with the family. But uh, if you guys like this, you know, let us like when this shuts off. Please go back and leave us a comment in the actual video that that will be produced after this. Let us know if you want us to keep this going. If you'd like to see it happen more often like do you like for us to step it up and do it twice a month or you know doing it in the middle of the month once a month every you know is that good enough for you guys but leave us a thumbs up go check out each of our channels if you haven't already and for me joe we thank you for watching and remember we do more than this more we got bubba we got tim and we got all you guys thank you so much for joining us yep thank you guys so much for watching stay tuned for next time yep see you guys oh and all right. 200 sub giveaway shameless plug guys yeah. tim is right there if you're not subscribed to tim's channel help him out so he can give away all that cool stuff okay I all right it. we'll see you on the next one Work. be sure to join us don't be late next time and we'll see you there here on bait shot talk take care <laughs>